But those are ways that your mood can affect your genre. So you have to choose carefully and very purposefully. Like you don't want to accidentally fall into a mood for your story. You, if you have a mood, you want to be purposeful and you want that to be on purpose so that you control how your readers are feeling. You, you always want your readers in whatever way. And of course, this is also dependent on genre. Like you want in horror, sometimes you want your readers to come away feeling like sad and destitute. Like that's the goal. So you have to choose a mood that accommodates that. But in most stories, you want them to come away either wanting to read more because it's a, a book in a series, or you just want them to come back and read more of your writing. And you want them to come away from the story feeling satisfied. And that satisfaction can take a number of different emotional routes. Like they can feel satisfied and happy. They can feel satisfied and sort of uh, bittersweet, you know, because there's always a, a gain and a loss depending on what happens to your characters, what you do to your characters in the end of the, in the, end of the story. But yeah, so genre definitely will affect your choices on what mood you try to go for, for throughout the story and your atmosphere as well. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 260 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Joshua Esso. Joshua is a freelance editor with over a decade of full-time work under his belt. He's edited for bestsellers Piers Anthony and David Farland, including the multi-award winning novel Nightingale by David Farland. And I've also hired Joshua as an editor and consultant on various projects over the years, and it is a fantastic conversation about world building, mood, and atmosphere, three important elements that writers need to know about. And that's coming up later in this episode. First, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that allows authors opportunities to get into the audiobook market. If you're looking for a narrator, you can find a narrator through Findaway Voices. What you can do is you can fulfill a, a form that will get the project management team over at Findaway Voices to go through their list of thousands of professional narrators around the world and find you the right voice. Or if you're a more DIY kind of person, you can use their marketplace to go seek out your own narrator. Or if you already have the audio files ready and they're produced and they're professionally done, you can use Findaway Voices to upload and distribute. And you can choose where you want to distribute it to, or you can go to the more than 43 retail and library platforms that they make their works assess accessible on. Now, one of the great things that I love about Findaway Voices is I can set my own price. I can do price promos with Nook audiobooks, with Apple audiobooks, and with Chirp. And the only way to get into Chirp which is owned by BookBub, is through Findaway Voices, and you can also apply for Chirp deals. All kinds of fantastic opportunities, all kinds of options for you when you're checking out what you want to do with your audiobook rights. And if you want to learn what you can do and how you can further your audiobook realm as an author, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Just going to briefly read some comments from recent episodes. So a comment uh, from Kim J over on episode 258, which is my June 2020 Reflective Hangout highlights. Kim says, audio sounds good on this end. No popping. The only thing was this low gonging sound when you switch between audio clips. Interesting podcast, which gives me ideas on how to capitalize my English, <laughs> English degree. 
And uh, thank you for that, Kim. And Kim was responding to the fact that in my notes, I was talking about using a lesser audio and I was in the, the house, my mom's old house uh, in an echoey kitchen. Um, and, and I guess it did sound relatively okay. But the low gonging sound was specifically me <laughs> using that uh, between clips. I wanted to, you know, indicate that it's from this, this is a different segment of, of the clips. And this was from those uh, reflective hangouts I did with my awesome patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash stark reflections. So thanks for that, Kim. I appreciate it. And also on YouTube, Kim J commented on episode 247, and this was a little while back, I'm just getting caught up in some of my previous comments, and this was on episode 247, my mom's influence on me as a writer, and it was it was my episode, you know, uh, reflecting on, on losing my mom and not realizing just how much she had influenced me as a writer, and Kim says, your mom was blessed to have had your support during your last days, and a mother's influence, kindness, and love will never be forgotten. Her memory will live on through you and your writing. Losing a mother is never easy. I know firsthand, but I do believe we will see them again someday. Living with purpose, as you are doing now, is the best way to honor her. Blessings, Kim. Thanks so much, Kim. Really appreciate that. Really appreciate uh, your thoughts, Kim. And, and of course, thoughts from so many previous people who have commented or emailed me, uh, etc. And and it's so true. Um, <laughs> living with purpose. And that's what I want to do both as a writer and as somebody who helps inspire and inform and maybe even entertain other writers out there. So thanks so much for that, Kim. Uh, that's uh, it for this week's catch up on comments. You can leave comments uh, over where it's posted to YouTube because uh, I do automatically port the podcast as an audio only into YouTube. Occasionally, when I find the time, I will use some of the recordings, just the recordings, not my intro blather, etc., but just the recordings of the video when my guests allow it. But of course, that takes time and, and I only have so much time in the day, so I don't always get them all up there. So sometimes I will batch load those, but you can leave comments over on YouTube. You can also leave comments on any episode of the podcast over at starkreflections.ca. You can also at me on Twitter. I am at Mark Leslie. And now for a bit of a personal update. I am recording this from uh, my hotel room in Gunnison, Colorado. I'm delivering numerous presentations and talks to both the graduates and the new students, or Padawans, of the Master's of Publishing program taught by Kevin J. Anderson at Western Colorado University. It's a unique program. There is no other one like that. Yes, there are MFAs about the art, etc., but this is about the business of writing and publishing, which is why it's an awesome program. And I'm here representing, you know, both my 30 years of experience in the industry, as well as my role as Director of Business Development at draft to digital Now, draft to digital is the sponsor of an anthology project that each cohort of students works on every year during this program, providing the funding to allow this program to pay professional rights for the stories they purchase for a beautiful anthology that's released in hardcover, trade paperback, and e-book editions. Now, last night, which was Wednesday, July 27th, 2022, I was honored to get to attend the book launch at the local arts center here in Gunnison, and it was a packed house, standing room only, and the students got to reveal this year's anthology, Gilded Glass, Twisted Myths, and Shattered Fairy Tales, as well as their individual projects, which they dig into the archives and, and find uh, they, they, they've got annotated, revised editions of lost or lesser-known public domain Classics from authors who may be familiar with, but maybe lost texts or texts that aren't as accessible, aren't as easily available in most cases. Think of these like those Penguin editions of the classics where they have special forwards by scholars or notable people in the field. Uh, now, I was honored this last year to be asked uh, as a writer of dark fiction and horror to write the forward to Carmilla by Sheridan Lafon, uh, Lafano. Sorry. <laughs> And this was edited by uh, student Savannah Stutkin. Now, Carmela is, of course, the novel that predates and inspired Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yes, uh, and I had never read it before, and it's such a great story. I actually listened to the audiobook version read by Canadian actress uh, Megan Follows, who 
played Anne of Green Gables in uh, in that classic TV show, not the new one, but the when I was when I was younger. Uh, great novel. It was phenomenal, groundbreaking novel, even in terms of sexuality and things that would just been really really taboo back uh, when it was published prior to Dracula. So not only was it groundbreaking, uh, influenced uh, Stoker, it influenced so many writers and uh, creators over the years, and it continues to influence writers and storytelling today. So that was just part of what was happening. What a phenomenal week to get to work with such great students and, and a wonderful program, which is really about educating the um, you know more people about the business aspects of writing and publishing so they can truly understand it top to bottom from both traditional publishing and from indie or self-publishing. And that's long been one of my passions and really the reason behind this podcast is just wanting to share and reflect on so many of the things that we have as options for authors and make sure that you, dear listener, can make those informed decisions. But that is it for the personal update and my precursor comments. Why don't we get right into my conversation with Joshua Esso. Joshua, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast, or I should say, welcome back to the Stark Reflections podcast. Yes, welcome back. I think this is what, my third time on? Oh, did did I have you on, on this twice or was that the Kobo Writing Life podcast? I'm, tr- I'm always trying to remember, right? Because I've interviewed you a number of times, but I'm not sure if it's it was for my podcast. It's true. I know that we've done this before, this specific thing. Oh, I we think have. Before, and then we've also done, I guess it was for Kobo. So, yeah. Yeah. So for listeners who aren't uh, lucky enough to have heard your previous <laughs> appearance on the Stark Reflections podcast, can you give our um, uh, listeners a little bit of a background. So who is, who is Joshua Esso? Oh, good question. <laughs> hitting, hitting with the hard stuff first, huh, Mark? <laughs> uh, I am a, uh, a freelance, a full-time freelance editor, and I've been editing since 2010. Uh, I started uh, accidentally because of a Superstars Writing Seminar and a conversation with uh, Brandon Sanderson, and uh, another guy who was attending the, the conference named Moses Seargard. He walked by, he heard his conversation, Brandon invited him over. And because of the feedback that I had for his story, he asked me to edit his novel. And I did, and I loved it. I thought that was great. I said, hey, well, why don't I just be an editor? <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, it was even better than that because I decided, why don't I be an editor to support myself while I be a writer? <laughs> so <laughs> here we are, what, 12 years later, and I'm... Uh, I've just become a, a writer, a, a, a published author, but here I'm still editing. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of cool. And, and it's been fun to watch you on this journey because I remember that Superstars writing seminars being on a panel with Dave Farland. Yeah. And and I remember I, I had been looking for an editor and and Dave's like, oh, my God, I've I've worked with Josh. He's, he's amazing. You've got it. And then, of course, I got on your nine month waiting list. Or right. Whatever it was. <laughs> So yeah, um, we did your, your werewolves uh, in Canada, right? Yeah, yeah. Way back when, like that was such a, a fun process. But I, so I knew of you as an editor and you were always helping other people and offering advice and that was your specialty. But then you actually got back to, you got back to Joshua, the writer. Can you talk about a little bit about that journey of getting back to that? Because, because you're a well-respected editor who's obviously in demand. Uh, it's not just like, hey, Joshua, can you edit my book next week? Uh, no, Mark, I'm booking six months out. <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> but but yeah. so how do you how did you do the transition? And then how do you make time for that? So the transition to writer happened because I there were there, there were a couple of reasons, but the most salient one was that one of my goals in editing is not just to have fun editing people's stories and to read all day. Like that's a great part of my job. Right. And I often say, you know, I've got, I've really got the best job in the world. I get to work <laughs> from home, get to read stories all day. Sometimes it's very difficult and brain draining, but yeah, it's a, a fantastic job and I love it. And one of the goals that I've had that's always been very important to me is to help writers become better writers. Like the sure paying the bills is great, but like my emotional connection to editing is because I want to help other people's dreams happen. I want them to come to fruition. And by helping them become stronger and better writers, that 
enables them to, you know, take steps forward in that process. So that's why um, the books were an extension of that, I, because there's only so many people that I can reach by editing a project for them, right? I, I get a book, like I'm working on a 500 and something page book right now this month. And this whole month is dedicated to that author. That's the author that I reach. And that's it. But if I had books where I talked about the most common problems that I'm seeing writers struggling with, then I can reach a whole bunch of extra people. I can, I can help a lot other, of other writers become more proficient, stronger, and maybe get up and achieve those dreams that they're trying to reach. So that was, that was the idea that spurred me along and finally made me carve out time within the editing, editing schedule to start writing these books. Okay. I like that. That is so cool. And we're going to talk about the specific topics because I do want to go back to the original topic and, and what you were helping writers with there and then what you're working on now. But mm. let's, let's just look at your day. So you divide up your day somehow. How do you divide up the day for your writing to get this project done and helping someone else's writing? <laughs> Well, the actual writing of this particular book, um, well, it was true of the last one too. It's, I don't suggest it to anybody. It's a little bit bonkers. Even though I've been working on this particular volume for a little bit over a year now, um, here we are getting close to the launch date to when I launch it on Kickstarter on August the 1st. And <laughs> my day starts, you know, doing chores and things like that. And then I start working on the book. Okay. Um, I'm in the editing stage, the, the final bit of the editing stage for world building, okay. which is the first subject of the book. And I am finishing up the actual writing for the second subject of the book, mood and atmosphere. Okay. So after I do that for a couple of hours, then I move on to my editing project. And I, I work on that. I have a quota of pages that I need to get done per day in order to finish the, the whole manuscript by the end of the month. Okay. So, you know, currently that means I'm editing until one or two in the morning. And then after that, <laughs> I... I, I take a break for uh, lunch. I like I posted on Facebook uh, the other day. Thing was on Thursday. I'm losing track of the days, honestly. I thought I was a day behind all week long. Uh, <laughs> I had uh, lunch at midnight on that day. <laughs> so, I saw that post. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, not an exaggeration. I had lunch, went back, finished editing, and then around two o'clock in the morning, one thirty in the morning, I worked on the Kickstarter campaign page until something like four thirty or five in the morning. Okay. So that's what the schedule is like right now. Like I said, uh, this isn't sustainable. Nobody should do this. <laughs> Plan better than me. <laughs> now, does this mean that uh, are you, like Dean Wesley Smith, for example, will write all night and then sleep most of the morning? Is that mm -hmm. your kind of schedule too? Oh, yeah. My normal schedule is uh, all catterwonky. Like I, I will uh, usually go to sleep somewhere between two and three in the morning and then wake up, you know, between 10, 30 and 11. So I have to ask, um, what's your wife's schedule like? It's actually pretty similar. Okay. Oh, really? But, okay. So yeah. it's not like she can't do things around the house because you're sleeping. No. Okay. If, if she didn't have a job where she had to go into the office, uh, she she's at uh, Johns Hopkins. And if she didn't have to go into to the office and actually have meetings and run participants and, and that kind of thing, she would be on the exact same schedule as I'm on. Okay. That's what her okay. natural book is. So it, it works out. We're, we're pretty much meant for each other. Okay. <laughs> oh, cool. So, so we talked talked about so we've got world building and and mood um uh, mood and atmosphere are the two yeah. topics of this book but it's not just a book it's it's two books but you've done something really unique with it and it's related to how you launched the first two books in this series yeah. as a book <laughs> yeah in a kickstarter can you can you kind of let's go back to the beginning and, and why you did this, uh, and obviously what the first two topics were, and then, and, and then we can kind of work our way through history here. Sure. So the, the idea sprung about after actual many years of what am I going to write about exactly? How am I going to do it? What's the treatment for the book? How is it different? And the ideas that I was really attracted to was to sort of pay homage to, uh, to comic books. So I was very drawn to that idea. And then um, uh, James Owen who's a, a very good writer and a amazing artist himself. Uh, he suggested that I make it a flip book. And I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. So 
that's what we did. And it turns out that that's, that's going to be the Kickstarter special editions. They're all going to be flip books. So you have a subject on one side and then you flip the book over and you have the second subject. And so action sequences and, se and sex scenes. So here's action sequences and turn the book around and then there's sex scenes. Right. Right. So the same, same principle that so we're doing the same thing with um, world building and mood and atmosphere. One side, one, although this book is going to be three times as long as the first one. It's just, well, it's world building. What do you want? <laughs> uh, yeah, it take, takes it takes at least seven days. Yeah, at least <laughs> minimum. <laughs> um, okay, so cool. So you've got that. And so I love this idea that, and, and it's probably some of it is logistics, right? Because when you go to make a paperback version that's for mass distribution through retailers, yeah. oh no, where are we going to stick the ISBN? It's going to ruin the one part of the book, right? Totally. It's exactly the problem I ran into. Like there, there, there was no place to put it. There's, there's two covers. There's this yeah. cover and then there, there's this cover. Where do you put a, an ISBN? Where do you put stuff on the cover? So this had to be simply a special printing, which is what Kickstarter enabled. Limited, me. special, worth Limited. a lot of money. That's like right. Collectors, yeah. So much money. <laughs> <laughs> Stick it in your attic for a hundred years, a guarantee. Make a fortune. <laughs> uh, so that's what I had to do for the, the special edition for the Kickstarter campaigns. But for when I release it wide, there, each subject is going to be split up into its own individual book. Right. Okay. So you have like a separate ebook and a separate print book. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Wow. I love that. I love that uh, concept uh, of doing it that way. So, um, and, I, and I'm trying to remember, because I, I have, I have the first one I was trying to find, I was just kind of looking on the shelves behind there. I have a signed copy. I'm trying to remember which one you signed or did you sign both sides? Probably just the one side. I, I think because, you know, when you finish the Kickstarter and you have, you know, your boxes and boxes and boxes of books. That's right. Hundreds picture. of books to sign. <laughs> yeah. You kind of grab one, you open the first pages and you sign it. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah, it's probably in the front pages of the action. Well, side. that's it. For an extra five dollars, you can get two signatures in one book. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> So, okay. So let, let's go back to this. So you're launching this Kickstarter yeah. on um, August 1st, August 1st, 22. We're recording this in the middle of July, 2022. So you're halfway yeah. done that editing project. Yeah. yeah. Or you better be halfway done. At this oh point. God. I'm like 360 pages in. I think. Oh, you're more than that. You're, you're like three quarters already. Yeah. I'll have a few days at the end of the month to, you know, stress over getting the last bits of the Kickstarter ready. <laughs> cool. So it's part of the same series. What's the name of the series called? Oh, the, the name of the series is Esso's Guides to Writing. Makes sense. A very yeah. own brand. It's it's Esso's Guide yeah. to Writing. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And this is, so I love this. So this, the, the idea is that, hey, I can't work with you because you can only work with, you know, maybe one or two or three authors at a time, depending on how you've scheduled that out. Because I know you fit in shorter projects when you've got a big book and stuff like that um, every once in a while. <laughs> Sneak, you sneak them in for people like Brandon <laughs> Sanderson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, although I, the, the man doesn't write short. So. No, no, he does not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the um, uh, wh where was I going to go with that? Um, the 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 branding. You've got the four books out. So it, this will be launched in August as a Kickstarter. The people who support this on Kickstarter will get it before anyone else gets it, and right. they'll get a special edition no one else can get. Right. That's kind of a unique thing to do. The other unique thing about it is, um, is Mr. Owen uh, involved in, in the art uh, like he yeah. was in the previous book? So you yeah. also have original art from James Owen, right? Exactly. Yeah. And there's a, um, just like the first one, there's a top tier reward level. If you back that, uh, I will, after I sign it, I'll mail it to James and James will do uh, a little picture. He'll draw something in the front pages and he'll sign it as well. Like, like when he signs books and he does the custom drawing in it? Right, oh exactly. Oh my God, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, <laughs> I forgot about that one. Yeah, yeah. So that's going to be really cool. And a little bit more fiddly. People have to wait a little bit, little bit longer for you know, things to be mailed back and forth, but yeah, worth that it. That makes sense. Yeah, that, that's true. I love that. And so let's talk a little bit about uh, world building in general. Like, so what are some of the mistakes that people make in world building? Uh, I've broken the book up into six major areas where I see world building kind of faltering and, and okay. getting in trouble, where writers start to have the most common problems with their world building. Um, the first one is uh, info dumping. So I have a, I have a long <laughs> chapter on info dumping, all the kinds of info dumping that you uh, might you know, feel inclined to include or run into as a reader. Right. Uh, okay, so let's see if I can remember. 
All six. Um, yeah, because there's there's six uh, major issues in world building, but also six info dumping styles. Okay, oh. so six info dumping styles are um, the world building info dump, the backstory info dump, uh, the technical info dump, where you're talking about like the very technical specifics of a, of a process or a right. magic or a technology, um, dialogue, thought, and emotion. Those are the six. So I go into a section on each one of those styles of info dumping, and I talk about what it looks like, um, how you can fix it if you've already done it, and how to avoid it before you do it. Oh, wow. I love that. That is fantastic. I was just... This morning, rereading uh, Kevin J. Anderson's Dan Shamble series that he kickstarted the new print editions, and I had to get yeah, the yeah, he did. paperback. Yeah, I backed that. <laughs> and as I was reading the opening of Death Warmed Over, the very first one, I was reminded at how strategically he builds the world of the, the big uneasy, mm. right? Because he starts off with, uh, you know, I'm a private investigator, death is my beat, that kind of, kind of thing, right. you know, just very tropey sort of noir. Right with some humor but then he slowly reveals well why is the world like this how did what what but it, mm. he doesn't do it all at once it's kind of like he gives you a little bit here a little bit there a little bit there and so is, is that the kind of thing that 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 helps with rather than just so tell us professor and then we pause for three pages <laughs> while we learn about where this planet came from and <laughs> right i love that so tell us professor i i, I talk about that exact thing uh, in, uh, in the book um the there's a lot of ways that you can go about that. So uh, what, you're, what you're talking about specifically is uh, some info dumping, right? How to get the information that he needs about his world to come across in a natural way that doesn't interrupt the flow of the story, right? right? So uh, info dumping, and then he is working on creating a history to the world, right? Giving it depth. Um, there is, there's a so there are three big things that you need to do in your world building when you're creating your world for um, what I call expansion. So you need to expand your world by broadening it, by deepening it, and by evolving it. And it sounds like what Kevin is doing there is he's deepening it by providing a sense of history, providing a, a sense that it has existed long before you started reading the pages, uh, the words that are on the pages. Right. right? Yeah. And then it looks like he is, um, uh, as he moves away from the history, uh, it sounds like he's broadening the world by increasing the scope of it, how that history affected a larger part of the world, right? right? And then uh, since to complete the, uh, the hat trick, so what is um, evolution then? Evolution is the change of your world over time. Um, and that time could be very short or it could be very, very long. It could be over centuries, right? Or it could be like there is a dramatic coup d'etat and the entire government of the main character's home is utterly changed. Right. And that would be evolution in a very short time scale. Okay. So again, there may be a character like Grandpa Simpson who comes along and says, in my time, we wore an onion on our belt because it was the style at the time. But it's just like a, a quick line, right? It's not yeah. like a typical meandering Grandpa Simpson story. <laughs> exactly. And then that, that's what I'm talking about a little bit in the info dump section is that you can create... Um, uh, huge senses of of time and, and evolution and backstory by just including a few words here and there. It doesn't have yeah. to be like paragraphs of information that you just sort of bomb your reader with. Yeah, because it's not like you get into this world and the world is this way, but it wasn't always this way. Yeah. There was a different government or there was a different socioeconomic status or there's this thing that technology that didn't exist. And oh, isn't it isn't it great now that we don't have horse-drawn carriages? You know, <laughs> right. And just a simple yeah. line like that. Isn't yeah. it great that we don't have horse-drawn carriages anymore, right? You don't have to explain when horse-drawn carriages were used, why they were used, and why they went away. You just drop that little bit of information that gives them an idea of the past, gives them a sense that the world existed for a long time. Right. And in certain cases, uh, it leads to a bit of intrigue, too. Like, oh, that's an interesting tiny bit of information about the past that makes me want to learn more. Yeah. So in other, in other words, you as, as the writer have to shackle your impatience to tell your readers everything right now. Right. Like, I know all this really cool stuff about my world. You have to know it too. <laughs> shackle that impulse <laughs> and, and spread it out. 
If you spread it out, not only will you prevent bombing your readers and making them feel bored or lectured or like they're reading a textbook, but you'll start drawing out a um, sort of like a story within a story. Like there's a there's a undercurrent underneath the the main storyline, the central conflict of your novel that is leading them through, and that little current is the intrigue and the mystery and the interest in how things got to the point that they're at when the story begins. Okay, cool. So I know you're you're a fan of uh, Tolkien, maybe Lord of the Rings, uh, as an sure. example of of a sure. fantastic Who isn't? <laughs> realm. I'm just wondering, are there examples of the way that Tolkien did his world building? Because it's such a massive, yeah, you know, setting, such yeah. a massive world that he's built. Um, are there examples that you can draw from, like using that as an example of okay, this is how he established you know, you know, customs of the hobbits, for example, or, sure. or whatever it is. Now, personally, I feel like um, Tolkien was a big time info dumper. <laughs> <laughs> but what I but thought he had was, a lot to dump. <laughs> he had a lot to dump. Yes, he did. He was primarily interested in languages and the world building itself. And the story was sort of a secondhand thing. Yeah. And that's fine. Like there are, there are stories that are uh, based on the world, right? There are stories that are based on characters, stories that are based on the conflict, a plot line, something, an interesting idea. There's other stories that are based on, I invented a really cool place that I just want to have characters move around in so I can show it off. <laughs> um, so I thought it was interesting how throughout his stories, he, uh, he does that thing where he drops words and he drops names and he drops uh, uh, a reference to an event, like a historical event. And he doesn't al always go into them. He just leaves it there and you go, oh, that sounds interesting. I want to know what happened there. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I mean, that's that's one of the reasons I think that he has such a gigantic fan base who are just like rapidly digging into his notes on the worlds, right? They're, they moved, they have moved long past the actual story of the thing. You know, um, Frodo and all his buddies, those guys were cool, but what about that world building, you know? Yeah. That's why I've got so many people who are like, you talk to them um, like, <laughs> like Stephen Colbert, <laughs> <laughs> who are just so into the story. The story was like, here's your free taste into the world building for them. I like that, I like that. So. But world building isn't always a fantastical world that doesn't exist, not like some set on another planet or in a different kind of universe with magic, etc. Uh -huh. Do you do world building if I'm writing a contemporary novel that's sort of set in 2022 and yeah. in, in New York or something like that? Yeah, no, that's a great question because yes, you can, absolutely. Um, world building isn't just the wholesale creation of something brand new. Um, it often is, and I think that people when they think of world building, that's the first thing that they go to. But for example, alternate history stories, they have to do world building. They have to create how like the butterfly effect worked on um, modern day America if uh, we lost the civil war or, and I think, I think that story has been done. I just can't remember the title of it. What if, what if we won in Vietnam? What if Susan B. Anthony or Harriet Tubman, Tubman were never born, you know, these kinds of things. And then you take the history from that point and you have to world build it out so that you reach, you know, wherever your story takes place. So yeah, there's a lot of world building that can still go into those kind of alternate history things. And if you're just writing a contemporary story, if it's completely based on our world, then what that amounts to is you're going to have to do research. Like you have to figure out how things really are. If your contemporary diverges from how things really are, that's when the world building begins. And, and I guess it could be a weird combination. So you can set it yeah. in modern day New York and know for sure that based on actual logistics and maps, there is no building on this corner. But what yeah. if there was? Yeah. Or I turn this building into a restaurant and it's really a retail outlet or whatever, because in my little world, everything else is the same, except this is a restaurant or whatever for the convenience of the characters. I mean, it can be it can be little elements like that that are based on a lot of research going, OK, this is a one way street heading in this direction. Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever. OK. Uh, the immediate example that pops into my mind is from Ghostbusters. Um, Dana Barrett's building 
Uh, that building, though, as a structure, it does exist in New York. I, I went there. I saw it. It was cool. Yeah. But they invented a completely new building, a complete history for it, yeah. why it was built. Like that took everything that was um, modern and regular and normal about uh, America at that time. And they included these world building elements. You know, in not least of which, of course, you know, there being a huge ghost, the spirit incursion into the world. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, who knows, right? We don't know. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> but okay, you know, I like that. Yeah. So you you recognize things and you understand, oh, this is this is how things are. Stranger yeah. things is it could, I guess, another example of the 80s. We remember yeah. the 80s were like, but we not necessarily the um all of the things. <laughs> right, right. But a lot of it was there. Oh yeah, Blockbuster and all of those other things that were part of our culture. So that is still yeah. world building, even if you didn't have a fantastical element. Exactly. Um the interesting thing about doing that is that you start from a place where you don't have to explain to readers what it's like, because readers already have a base in reality. So right. that whole part where in, in a world that you're creating from scratch, where you have to sort of acclimatize them to where they are and, you know, how, where the characters um, are moving through that world people will automatically start in a place where they understand all of that. So there's a lot of less expedition and expo exposition and explanation that you have to do in a world that starts where readers are already. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I love that. Now I want to get into, I want to get into mood and atmosphere and oh, come on, Josh. Well, why, what do we even need mood and atmosphere in, in, in our books? <laughs> Uh, I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> a slow pitch, right? Right, right, yeah. right, right down the center. Right down the center. See, because that was a question that I asked too. I was like, how important is this? That was one of the, the primary things that I thought about when I started writing the book in the first place. Um, but let's back up for a second. So what in the world are we talking about, right? When we're talking about mood and atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And that was another thing that I had to really pause and consider for a long time as well, because what I found as I dug more and more into the subject was that unlike world building, uh, there is sort of a lack of information about mood and atmosphere. There aren't there are absolutely articles written about them and there are there they are addressed in certain books, but Compared to all of the other facets of writing, I mean, um, world building, of course, uh, conflict, uh, structure, character development, um, pacing, theme, all of those things have a lot of material devoted to them, where I, I found that mood and atmosphere was strangely lacking. And I, in what I read, there were differing ideas about what even the definitions of these things were. So that's one of the things that I first of all tried to address in this book to give them a set of definitions that was, you know, concrete and understandable, like easily accessible. Right. So mood then is, of, I mean, of course, every aspect of your writing can contribute to the mood. The mood is basically how it makes you feel. Um, mood is uh, the emotion suffused into the story through the characters as they move through the plot. Right. It's um, it's the emotional framework, if you will, of a scene that's built through the characters and your themes and your tone. It's how you feel upon reading it. So, I mean, given that, it's not surprising, I suppose, that every reader encountering a certain story that has mood built into it is going to come away with possibly a slightly different reaction to it. So a slightly different mood is perceived. Right. And so that's something that you'll have to take into account while you're developing your mood. But yeah, so that's not to be confused with the grammatical mood. Like that's um, <laughs> that's a that's a verb inflection, yeah. right? Um, so what is it? Subject, subjunctive? No, yeah, subjunctive, indicative, and imperative. Yes, those three. And that and what those do are they express uh, an action uh, or a state perceived by the speaker. So that's the grammatical version of what, what mood is, right. but we're talking about what I call the emotionality of your story, mood and atmosphere together combined, create the emotionality and emotionality is all of the emotions and feelings that that story gives you. Um, and that can be directed. Um, and sometimes you, you can't control how your readers are going to feel. <laughs> so, Atmosphere, then, um, I feel atmosphere is a subset of mood, like it is a part of mood, but it is also a big enough part of mood to warrant its own subject matter, because 
uh, atmosphere, whereas mood is created by the characters, atmosphere is created by the setting, right? Mm -hmm. So atmosphere is the emotion suffused in a story through the setting and your world building, which of course is how it links very well into the first subject. Um, it, okay, here's, a, here's an example of atmosphere. It was the very beginning of A Wrinkle in Time. And shoot, let me pull it up because uh, it is a great excerpt that gives you an immediate emotional reaction. Okay, here it is. It was a dark and stormy night. In her attic bedroom, Margaret Murray, wrapped in an old patchwork quilt, sat on the foot of her bed and watched the trees tossing in the frenzied lashing of the wind. Behind the trees, clouds scudded frantically across the sky. Every few moments, the moon ripped through them, creating wraith-like shadows that raced along the ground. The house shook. Atmosphere, right? right? Every time I read that, I get, I get tinglies. Like yeah. that is a, for me, that is a very strong example of creating a feeling of, of a tense atmosphere, of a, a feeling of, of expectation and perhaps even fear. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about building atmosphere into your story, creating that emotional reaction in your readers. When I, when I read that, did you have any response? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I could feel, I could see, I could uh, anticipate. Yeah. Right? Like, there, yeah. There, yeah, there was some, wow. Um, and then, of course, there's the purple uh, line that opened it, which, which is the old token. <laughs> it was dark and stormy night. Right. But even even using something like that, which is very tropey, it, it's it's just that line alone. Yeah. It, I mean, it's 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 kind of now it would be considered a lazy way. <laughs> right. It's so funny. I, I talk about actually that exact line in the book because uh, that was when it first came out, it was it was an awesome new way to immediately create a sense of emotion. Yeah. And now it's become, you know, sort of a meme, sort of overused yeah. a trope. Uh, yeah. But when it first, when it first appeared, it was very effective. Oh, for sure. Because they, and, and that's why it became a trope because, yeah. oh my God, all I have to do is say dark and stormy night. And you're like, I'm there. Oh, scared. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Something bad's going to go down. Yeah. Like I better lean. I better, I call it the lean in moment. I better lean in to see what's going to happen next. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can, so for, for people who still don't get it, it, how do mood and atmosphere interact with the, the book's genre or, or at least that sort of element of, uh, is there some interplay? Is there some experimentation that can happen? Some Absolutely. Crossover? Yeah. So your mood and atmosphere can play off of your genre or it can counterpoint it depending on, depending on what your goal is with the story. Okay. So um, for example, if you're writing a rom-com, you're going to want a mood that is going to make people feel relaxed, um, uh, amused. You're going to make them want to feel like, um, uh, to the extreme, like they're falling in love too, right? right? If you go with a rom-com that evokes horror, <laughs> you're, you might be missing the mark, but maybe that's your, your artistic, you know, interpretation of, you know. <laughs> Unless it's dark humor of a date gone wrong. <laughs> right. I mean, and they have done um, horror rom-coms, of course, right? But there's always an element of, you know, that calm, that comedy. That's why it's called a rom-com. But um, yeah, if you took a, a romantic relationship, a story about a romance, and you gave it a mood of, of anticipation and of yearning and of, um, of hope, contrast that with taking the exact same story and giving it a mood of suspense, of, um, of delay, and even of horror. Like, what if that relationship is set in a zombie apocalypse? Right, yeah. Right. As compared to sending it um, in a hotel in Japan while one of them is filming a commercial. Right. Okay. Right. Um, lost in translation. So, <laughs> which I would, not, I would not call comedy. That one had um, comedic moments, but it was definitely not. A... Anyway, uh, Love that movie. 
<laughs> but those are ways that your mood can affect your genre. So you have to choose carefully and very purposefully. Like you don't want to accidentally fall into a mood for your story. Right. You, if you have a mood, you want to be purposeful and you want that to be on purpose okay. so that you control how your readers are feeling. You, you always want your readers in whatever way. And of course, this is also dependent on genre. Like, you want in horror, sometimes you want your readers to come away feeling like sad and destitute. Like that's the goal. So you have to choose a mood that accommodates that. But in most stories, you want them to come away either wanting to read more because it's a, a book in a series, or you just want them to come back and read more of your writing. And you want them to come away from the story feeling satisfied. And that satisfaction can take a number of different emotional routes. Like they can feel satisfied and happy. They can feel satisfied and sort of uh, bittersweet, you know, because there's always a, a gain and a loss depending on what happens to your characters, what you do to your characters in the end of the, in the, end of the story. But yeah, so genre definitely will affect your choices on what mood you try to go for, for throughout the story and your atmosphere as well. That is awesome. Thank you. So um we've got some great tips on mood atmosphere on uh, world building and joshua please can you share uh so it's going to be launching this is the kickstarter can, can you give us a heads up of some of the rewards you have planned or is that still sure. a secret <laughs> no, no 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 they're not secret um so it's launching on august 1st it's going to run for 30 days and and on august 30th and some of the rewards are um first of all you know the digital books Right. The physical books. Um, I, I also have um, an early bird that I'm going to try out. Haven't tried an early bird before. So this will be an interesting experiment. The early bird will allow you to get the first book, um, action sequences and sex scenes, plus the second book, world building and mood and atmosphere. Oh, cool. Okay. And it, it will be for the first um, 48 hours. And uh, people will pay a reduced uh, price for that. And there, I think I've, what I've limited it to 52 copies and the first 48 hours. So we'll see how that works out. Like, I, I think that's a pretty cool reward if somebody hasn't backed the first Kickstarter already. Right. Um, other rewards are after we move past the actual physical books and, and well, digital books, uh, I offer some services. Now I'm not offering as many services as I did last time because I learned my lesson. Uh, I know, and I took so such great advantage of that. Thank you. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> no, we had a great consult. Uh, that was phenomenal. Yeah. I, I mean, for anyone who's thinking, Yes, take advantage of this if you can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Yeah, I love the consult calls. So that's one of the rewards, of course, again, this, this time around. Uh, the consultation calls are basically where you have questions about your story. You're, you're, you're blocked. Um, you, can't, you can't write. Uh, you need to go over your outline or you have an idea for a story. You're not sure how to make it work. Any of those questions, any like writing related questions, we talk for an hour. And I help you figure it out. You know, the goal with all these consultation calls is to make you come away from that call feeling like really enthusiastic to get back to your story. Yeah. So those are, those are on a tier. Um, I'm also editing the first five pages of stories um, in a tier, in multiple tiers. And uh, I, I had to do away with this time, the three hours of editing, because that just that killed me. <laughs> oh, I, I can only imagine how you had lost sleep trying to get caught up on that. Yeah, yeah, that, that killed me the first time around. So there's not none of that this time, but um, I have included a new thing. Uh, so after we get past the consultation calls on the first pages, um, then uh, the one where James will draw in the book for you. Um, and then I, I've also, there's only three of them because that's the most I think that is reasonable for me to try and accomplish. But I'm, I'm offering all those other things in combination with also having a meal, like sitting down, and having a meal together, and however long that takes, and you know, continuing to talk about your your story, because in that particular reward, you will have had first five pages and a consultation call already. So oh, okay. maybe you do those, and then we sit down. Maybe we're at a con together somewhere, or who knows? Maybe you're local to to, to Maryland. Yeah, we go have dinner and continue talking about your story or about a whole new thing or about publishing in general, whatever it is that you want to talk about. Or it could just be like a midnight lunch with Joshua, right? <laughs> oh that is awesome i love that so that's launching and uh, you're gonna you're gonna give me the link so i can drop that in the show notes yeah so absolutely yeah cool. absolutely. and then so this launches end of august and then obviously the rewards get fulfilled over whatever and then when do the books become available to 
you know, the people who weren't lucky enough or smart enough to uh, right. support the Kickstarter? And that's a really good question. So uh, we're, we'll finish up the Kickstarter at the end of August. And then I'll, th there'll be a two week period while I wait for Kickstarter to do all of its internal stuff and then say, yes, here's all, here are all the funds. And I take those funds and I go to the printer. Uh, not sure how long that's going to take. What I'm saying in the Kickstarter is that I am going to get you your books by Christmas. Okay. Um, it could very well be earlier than that. It really right. just depends on, on mail. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. You know, and, and how backed up the, the publisher is right now. I don't feel like they're especially backed up. So I think that I'll be able to get a good position in line, but uh, we'll have to just wait and see. Cool. And uh, Joshua, thanks for hanging out with me. Can you please leave my listeners with where they can find out more about you online? Yeah, uh, you can go to my website. That's probably the easiest place. It's joshuaso.com. And you can find me on Facebook. My profile is public um, and I, I post there all the time. And uh, lesser used like Twitter, and I have to figure out my Instagram at some someday here and <laughs> get that get that going. But yeah, I'd say that uh, my website and Facebook are the easiest places to get a hold of me. Awesome! Thanks for hanging out with me again, Joshua. Thanks, Mark. I wanted to reflect on two of the things I guess that Joshua talked about, and, and I think one of the ones was recognizing when you're looking at books you know we talked about Tolkien we talked about what Kevin Janderson did uh, setting up uh, in Death Warmed Over the first book of the Dan Shamble Zombie PI series the world building and one of the things we can learn by looking at books and understanding where and how the world building happens and paying attention to that not just reading it as a reader and enjoying it but recognizing like I did when I was recently reading Kevin's book recognizing how he's just slowly filtering in little bits of information through dialogue, through narration, you know, exposition, etc. But in such a way that I got a feel for the world, not in one big giant info dump, but in layers. So the next book you're reading, whether it's uh, a world uh, that's not like ours, a, a unique world, or whether it's our world, but in you know a uniquely different version of that world, because still the setting and characters and everything is part of that world building. That's something to really pay attention to as a reader and see if that's something that you can do. Now, the other thing I wanted to attend to is just the idea of being purposeful when creating and sharing mood in your writing. Because when you're thinking about the story, you're really, the, the story is about these characters and these things they want to achieve. And it's the story of them either accomplishing them or not accomplishing them through the actions they take or don't take through the story, etc. But purposefully understanding, I always talk to authors about, and I was doing it this week here in Colorado, the idea of when you're writing your blurb or your sales pitch or whatever for the book, you think about that emotion, that emotional resonance. How do you want the reader to feel? Like, how do you want them to lean in and think about what are the what are those things that you want them to experience and feel? And that may be something you want to build into the blurb. But thinking about that in the writing, so maybe not even if it's in the first draft, obviously being conscious of it, but when you're going back through the, the manuscript and you're purposefully looking at uh, elements, and I can't recommend enough the Emotion Thesaurus, uh, which I'll include a link to, in, uh, and that's Angela Ackerman, and of course I'm forgetting the other person's name off the top of my head, but that they've got this whole series uh, that can help you with like here, here are the words that you know bring up this kind of feeling or mood etc and they've got some great resources for writers and i'll also include a link to their awesome web page for you as well but those are just two of the things that i wanted to reflect on based on this conversation now i'm recording this on july 28th 2022 joshua's kickstarter will go live on august 1st 2022 and i don't yet have a link for it however so if you're looking at the show notes and it's still the 29th or the 30th or whatever, <laughs> I may not have the link to it and I'll be appending that to the show notes on August 1st or if I happen to get the link a little bit earlier. But you can check that out because I definitely took advantage of for the Kickstarter he did last time of the hour-long consult and it was a phenomenal thing that really helped me in building out some of the work that I did for uh, Fear and Longing in Los Angeles, and Fright Night's Big City. I actually did a consult with Joshua on that, and I also did a consult with Clark Chamberlain about some of the issues I was having. So just having on top of the editing that was done on that afterwards, this is like prior to the writing, 
and development, it almost like the development ed editorial discussions where I had some samples of the writing and what I wanted to do. And, and I worked with these two amazing folks to help me, you know, bring those books together in a, in a really wonderful way. I think, of course, I'm a little bit biased, but I do highly recommend working with those kinds of professionals to help better your writing and the experience for your readers. So that's it for episode 260 of the Stark Reflections podcast. Again, this is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to support this podcast, of course, you can leave a review for it on the podcatcher of your choice. Reviews, as authors know, make a huge difference. So just taking the time to leave one line of review of, you know, if you like it, what you like about it, etc., would be great. You can also share it with someone that you think would find value in my Stark Reflections. So again, this is the end of episode 260. Until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.